Good morning, everyone. And so we continue today with our reading of Friedrich. Um, yesterday, we clearly saw things uh, deteriorate in Nazi Germany uh, for the Schneider family, and things continue to do so as we move into our new chapter. And we start in 1938, which clearly is uh, one year before the outbreak of uh, World War II. In the swimming pool. It was hot. No one who didn't have to went outside. Only a few people dragged themselves sweating through whatever shade they could find. We had arranged to meet outside the town where the woods began and then cycled together to the swimming pool. Mother had loaned me her bicycle. It didn't look beautiful anymore, but it still worked very well. Friedrich arrived on his shining new blue bicycle. Not only was the bicycle new, he had polished it as well. On the way to the forest pool, we sang hiking songs like Wolderlust, and Friedrich let go of his handlebars. His bicycle swung from one side of the road to the other. Suddenly, a man approached on a silvery bicycle that gleamed in the sun. Even Friedrich's bike couldn't compare with that. Despite the heat, the other cyclist seemed to be in a great hurry. He rang his bell when he was still far away because Friedrich was still swinging back and forth across the road. Friedrich gripped his handlebars, but otherwise paid no attention to the man. He forced him to brake hard, with ang with the, while the, which the stranger did, swearing loudly. Only at the last possible moment did Friedrich clear the way. The cyclist rode on, pedalling furiously. Friedrich whistled after him through his fingers. Far from turning around, the strange only pushed harder on the pedals and sped down the path. A quarter of an hour later, we reached the forest swimming pool. We chained our bikes to a tree, and after getting undressed, we handed in our things and received tanks with numbers in exchange. Friedrich tied his to his ankle and jumped into the water. He could swim much better than I, and he was an excellent diver. I showered first and then I carefully went down the stairs into the cold water and swam after Friedrich. Until late afternoon we played in the water and let ourselves be broiled by the sun. When I finally looked at the big clock over the entrance, we'd already stayed past our time. We were going to collect our clothes when Friedrich couldn't find his tag. He ran back and dived to the bottom of the pool, but he didn't find the tag. Shrugging his shoulders, he joined the line of the other boys waiting to get their things. They were slow at the checkout counter. The attendant was very busy. I was ahead of Friedrich and received my hanger first. I changed quickly. And when I came out of the locker room, Friedrich was still standing in line. I wrung out my bathing trunks and wrapped them in my towel. Finally, the attendant turned to Friedrich. He scolded him when he heard what had happened. Then he let Friedrich come to the other side of the counter. Shivering with cold and accompanied by the sullen attendant, Friedrich searched for his things. The attendant was about to let him wait until after he attended to the waiting boys when Friedrich shouted, there they are. The attendant took down the hanger he pointed to and carried it to the counter. There he hung it from a hook. What's your name? He asked. Uh, Friedrich Schneider. Where's your ID? In the right back trouser pocket, the, the button's loose. The tendon looked for the pocket, unbuttoned it and pulled out the case with the identification card. Then he took out the card and looked at it. Friedrich still stood before the counter, his teeth chattering. He looked at the ground and seemed embarrassed. All of a sudden, the attendant whistled loudly through his teeth. From the other side came the female attendant. Just take a look at this, the attendant said. You won't get to see many more of them. Everyone could hear his explanation. This is one of the Jewish identification cards. This scoundrel lied to me. He claims his name's Friedrich Schneider. It's Friedrich Israel Schneider. That's what it is. A Jew, that's what he is. A Jew in our swimming pool. He looked disgusted. All those still waiting for their clothes stared at Friedrich. As if he could no longer bear to touch it, the attendant threw Friedrich's identification card and its case across the counter. Think of it! Jewish things among the clothes of respectable human beings! He screamed, flinging out the coat hanger, holding Friedrich's clothes on the ground so they scattered in all directions. While Friedrich collected his things, the attendant announced, now I have to wash my hands before I can go on my work. Ah! 
he walked away from the counter, kicking one of Friedrich's shoes into a blocked up foot bath. He returned before Friedrich found all his things. It's your affair where you get dressed, he snarled at him. You won't get into our changing rooms. Helpless and still damp, Friedrich clutched his clothes. He searched for a place where he could dry himself and get dressed. There was no protected corner, and he hastily rubbed himself with his towel and pulled his trousers on over the wet bathing trunks. Water dripping from his trouser legs, he left the swimming pool. The attendant was still screaming, but we could no longer understand what he was saying. I had already unlocked our bikes. Friedrich fastened his things on the luggage carrier. He didn't care, he didn't dare to look into my eyes. Quickly he said, I'll, I'll dress properly in the woods. Then we heard uproar behind us. This is where it was, said a big boy. I'm quite sure this is where I locked it. I've searched everywhere, but it's gone. It was all silver. I, I, I just polished it too. A lot of curious boys quickly collected. They, they gave advice. Follow the trail, inform the police. Friedrich pricked up his ears. He left his bicycle and walked to the circle that had formed around the boy whose bike had been stolen. Y you there? Friedrich said to him. I, I know who stole your bike. I saw the man who did it. I, I can describe him in detail. Everyone looked at Friedrich. A lane formed between him and the owner of the silver bike. The boy stepped closer to Friedrich. Say, he asked, aren't you the Jew from the pool a while back? Friedrich blushed, lowered his eyes to the ground. You don't think the police would believe you, do you? So clearly we can see in this chapter that the boys have grown up a little bit. They're getting more independent, perhaps moving into their teenage years. Um, they're allowed to um, go out and be a bit more, uh, have a bit more freedom, be a bit more independent. Um, but clearly that's easier for Hans than it is for Friedrich um, because there are now so many restrictions placed around what Jews are allowed to do. And you see that little insert into the name of Friedrich, Friedrich Israel Schneider. And this is really to mark out and make the Jews stand out um, from other people, um, further ostracizing them from, from, Jewish, uh, from German society. The festival, 1938. Friedrich had met me on the street. Come, he said, making me curious. You'll see something very special. I had gone with him, even though I had to keep thinking of my father. Only a week ago, he had begged me, don't show yourself so often with the Schneiders. Otherwise, I will have difficulties. Now we stood in the large room of the synagogue, Herr Schneider, Friedrich and I. Friedrich and his father wore their best suits, while I looked shabby in my everyday clothes. Gradually, the bench in front of us filled up, Men with hats on their heads shook hands with us and wished us good Shabbos. All found an extra word of kindness for Friedrich or patted his shoulder. One by one, everyone left his, lifted his seat, revealing a small compartment underneath. Friedrich took a large white scarf from his, as well as a prayer book and his yamulk. Exchanging the latter for his cap, he touched the fringed scarf with his lips and draped it around his shoulders. My talis, my prayer shawl, he whispered to me. A man wearing a black hat and a long black coat that reached to his feet walked to a podium in the centre of the room. The podium was covered with a carpet and he opened a thick book from the back and immediately began to chant a prayer. Our oh, rabbi, Friedrich informed me in a low voice. Then he too opened his prayer book and prayed in Hebrew. From time to time, he interrupted the rabbi's prayer with an interjection and at one point, he seemed to start a completely different prayer. I was astonished. How did Friedrich know Hebrew so well? He had never told me anything about it. And suddenly it seemed like one of the, he seemed like one of the many adults around us. 
From time to time, he looked up from his prayer book and nodded to me. The rabbi prayed facing the east, swaying back and forth. He kept making small bows to the east wall, which was covered with a red curtain. The rabbi prayed facing the east. Sorry, this curtain was embroidered with Hebrew characters. Otherwise, there wasn't a single picture in the room. No ornaments, only large, many branched candelabra with candles in them. From a side balcony, the women watched the service. While I was still examining the inside of the synagogue, the voices of the congregation merged with the rabbis and the chant grew louder. With measured steps, the rabbi walked to the curtain, the red velvet was pulled aside, and behind it a small door in the wall could be seen. The rabbi opened the door, then stood aside so everyone could look into the box. That's our Torah, inside the ark, Friedrich explained. The Torah was wrapped in a cloth decorated with a silver crown and shield. The rabbi lifted the heavy scrolls out of the ark. In solemn procession, he carried them from the through the synagogue. Wherever he passed, members of the congregation left their seats, touched the Torah with their talisman, and then touched the talisman to their lips. Now comes the surprise, Friedrich told me. He seemed very excited. Herr Schneider, pulled Friedrich to him and soothingly patted his shoulder and stroked his hair. At the podium, the crown, the shield and the cloth were removed from the Torah and the great parchment placed on the podium. One after the other, the rabbi called seven congregants to the podium and then he called Friedrich. Herr Schneider put both hands on his shoulder. Proudly, he looked into his son's eyes before sending him away. The rabbi also greeted Friedrich much more solemnly than he had the men before him. For the first time in his life, he's been called to read the weekly section, Herr Schneider proudly told me. Afterwards, he's also permitted to read a section from the prophets. Like the men before him, Friedrich touched the Torah with his talus, as, he instru as instructed by the rabbi, then kissed the talus. Then he recited the blessing. But while the prayer leader had chanted a Torah section with each of the men before him, Friedrich took over the silver staff, led it along the lines from left to right and chanted his section of the Torah by himself. When he'd read his section quickly and surely, he touched the last passage once more with his talis and the talis with his lips. While the scrolls of the Torah were again wrapped in their ornaments, Friedrich read the section from the prophets from a large book. Then he returned to his seat. Just as at the beginning of the service, the rabbi carried the Torah in procession through the synagogue and again the congregation, congregants pressed towards it. The rabbi replaced the Torah in the ark, said another prayer before closing the little door. Then he gave a sermon. For the first time since I entered the synagogue, he spoke in German. And the sermon was directed solely at Friedrich. It singled him out before the whole congregation. Men kept looking at Friedrich, nodding to him with smiles of well wishes. Today, a week after your 13th birthday, the rabbi said, you have for the first time in your life been called upon to read a section from the Torah. This is an honour for every Jew, but the day on which this happens for the first time is a special day. With it begins a new phase of your life. From now on, you alone will be responsible to the Lord our God for your deeds. Until this day, your father has borne his resp this responsibility. But from now on, you stand among us as an equal member of this congregation. Remember that. Obey the commandments of the Lord. No one can take away your guilt if you break them. You are assuming a difficult duty in a difficult time. We are chosen by the Lord our God to be guided back into our homeland by the Messiah and there to help find his kingdom. God has placed the heavy burden of persecution upon us until that day. We must continually remind ourselves what the Lord our God has determined this fate. We must not and cannot escape it, not even when we feel we will collapse under it. Reflect. The Holy Torah demands. And the rabbi finished his sermon with a sentence in Hebrew. 
Soon afterward, the service closed with a communal song. I waited outside the synagogue for Friedrich and his father. There were so many questions I was burning to ask, but there was no opportunity. All the men from the congregation came over and congratulated Friedrich. One could see how proud he felt. After the women also left the synagogue, we went home in a flock of relatives and friends. Frau Schneider had run ahead. She received us by the door and led us into the living room where she'd arranged a festive Sabbath feast. There was plenty of everything. But before the feast could begin, Friedrich gave a speech, just like a grown up orator. Dear father, dear mother, dear relations, he began, the Lord had, has ordered us to honour father and mother so that we may long live in the land that he has given us. May he forgive me for not following his commandments sufficiently until this day. For 13 years, dear parents, you have instructed me and guided me in the commandments of our Lord through good times and bad times. It is thanks to you who have stood by me that I have today been received into the congregation. In my thoughts and my deeds, I will show myself worthy of this honour and duty. May the Lord grant you, dear parents and relations, 120 years of healthy and joyful life so that I may find time to repay the thanks that I owe you. Frau Schneider wept. Herr Schneider looked at the floor, absent-mindedly rummaging in his jacket pocket. When Friedrich finished his speech, everyone applauded and his father presented him with a wristwatch. The other guests had brought presents too. Tell me, I asked Friedrich in a whisper, where did you learn all the Hebrew and the speech? Friedrich smiled proudly. Learned it. Had to practice my Torah section and the speech for almost three months. I showed my astonishment. Friedrich enjoyed it. Shall I tell you what Friedrich is in Hebrew? He asked me. I nodded. Solomon, Friedrich told me, laughing. While we ate, the doorbell rang. I wonder who could come this late? Frau Schneider asked, puzzled. She went to the door and opened it. Herr Nyudov, his former teacher, came into the room. He wished Friedrich all the best on his bar mitzvah, then gave him a fountain pen. Friedrich's name had been engraved in gold on the cap. Every time I read this paragraph with various classes over the years, I can't help but be reminded of how similar this Bar Mitzvah festival is to some of the festivals we might readily participate in as, as Christians, whether it's our First Holy Communion or probably more our confirmation when as Christians we're, we're asked to take responsibility for our own faith life and our own faith journey. What I always think is interesting is you, you see how the two religions are connected together and that common ancestry and how the traditions have developed one from the other. And in fact, probably how we're not so very different. Whether it's reading books from the Old Testament, whether it's making pledges to be responsible to God, whether it's um, taking responsibility for our own faith life through confirmation. And it reminds us of our commonality and why we should all work together. And I think at this point in the story, it's quite poignant to remember that, because as German society is fracturing and the Jewish people are becoming more persecuted, it, it stands as a, as a stark contrast. This, this moment, this lovely moment of celebration stands as a stark contrast to what has come before in the previous chapter of the swimming pool and what will come again as we move on in the, in, in the story. So I think we've got time for one more chapter today and we'll read The Encounter, 1938. Our physical education teacher was Herr Schuster. Herr Schuster was also a commander of stormtroopers and in the First World War he had been a captain. All who knew him feared his severity. Anyone who disobeyed him, or perhaps changed too slowly, was forced to do knee bends until he collapsed. We all kept out of his way if we could. 
Physical education at Herr Schuster understood it consisted primarily of marches. Forced marches, marches with a full pack, and, what, and whatever other marches he could think of. One day, just before our double gym lesson, he came into our classroom. No break today, he announced. You'll get enough fresh air without it. We're going on a forced march. Our faces fell. But no one dared object, not even Carl Misson, who sprained his ankle after a daredevil jump during our last gym lesson. Everyone empty their briefcases and satchels, ordered Herr Schuster. Notebooks and textbooks under your desks. Immediately, we did as told. Form one line in the yard, the last man to stand three steps from Chestnut Tree. Take your briefcases and satchels, quick march! The order echoed through our classroom. We picked up our satchels and briefcases. We raced down the stairs to avoid being late. Herr Schuster already stood in the yard. We looked for our places in the line. Fall in line, what I said! He barked at us. That means attention! He took a deep breath. To the wall, quick, march! We dashed towards the wall, but he stopped with us. Stopped us with an attention! Before we could reach it. We had to fall in line once more. Again, again rush the wall, again assemble, then marching in formation, we moved towards the gym. Bricks left by a construction firm that ages ago were stacked against the gym wall. Herr Schuster now stuffed these bricks into our briefcases and satchels. My briefcase is larger than the others. They only got two bricks. Franz Schulten complained as Herr Schuster loaded three into his bag and added yet another. The owners of briefcases usually patronised the satchel bearers, but today they were envied because they could carry their loads on their backs. We fell into march formation and went off. Still inside the school district, where parents might be watching, Herr Schuster had us sing a song. Chastum im Osten. Do you see in the east? Second verse. When the last of the columns shouted, done, the head roared back, three, four, and we began again. Many years have gone their way, with our nation enslaved and defrauded. Traitors and Jews out of this made their gain, asking the sacrifice of legions. Then to our people, a Fuhrer was born, who restored hope and faith to our people. Germany to arms, Germany to arms. With the heavy bricks in our packs weighing us down, we used up our last breath. We, we barely left the district when we were ordered to continue double time. We circled half our town like that. An hour and a half later, we dragged ourselves back into our school district. The handle of Franz Schulten's case had broken. He carried his case full of bricks on his shoulder. His jacket was soaked through with sweat. Carl Nissen, with his sprained ankle, been left behind crying. The rest of us could hardly walk straight. But Herr Schuster strode at our side, erect and at ease. He smiled mockingly whenever he caught one of us limping. In this condition, we encountered another class. Class. At first, we didn't recognise anyone, but then we discovered Friedrich. It was a class from the Jewish school. Herr Schuster had also spied Friedrich. Boys, he said crisply. Now we'll show them over there what German boys are made of. You're not going to let yourselves be ridiculed by those inferior Jews, are you? I expect perfect timing is that understood. He marched along the column and pu pushed us weary marchers back into line. We made a gigantic effort to pull ourselves together, straightened up. I just ordered a song. Eyes staring fixedly ahead, laden down but erect, we marched past the Jewish class and belted out. Crooked Jews are marching along. They're marching through the Red Sea. The waves clove over them. The world is at peace. You can only imagine how difficult it must have been for Jewish people in Nazi Germany to put up with that sort of vitriol and meanness, for want of a better word. 
And I have to say I was taken by watching a rally in America on YouTube the other night, which was frightening in many ways for the similarities that you can see in this period here in Nazi Germany and perhaps some of the things that are said and the way they are said at some of those rallies. As I said before, there are perhaps lessons we all need to learn from history. Thanks very much for reading today. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll carry on tomorrow with the pogrom, which I assure you is a terrifying chapter. Have a good day.